speakers that would allow us to have a better conversation. Okay, fantastic. So welcome everyone uh, to a new webinar uh, by Euroconsumers. Uh, my name is Alberto Lemano. I will be moderating uh, this panel. And today, uh, after setting the scene, we're gonna have the chance to have uh, Petra de Suter uh, sharing with us her work uh, around Dieselgate uh, five years after the events, which will be follow up by a panel discussion. Um, let me tell you that, uh, yes, almost five years have passed by since the moment of that tragic revolution, uh, revelation uh, that Volkswagen uh, has misled their customers uh, for many years by selling cars that polluted way more uh, NOx than they actually promised to do. Uh, this affected many consumers all around the world. US consumers were quickly, I would say swiftly, uh, compensated. Uh, but the Volkswagen Group hasn't proven to be as efficient, as effective, as committed to uh, and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, European consumers. In the meantime, uh, European consumers tests have shown that even after the repair, um, uh, the emissions uh, from those cars remain uh, too high. And even after having the device uh, removed, 45% uh, of the cars encounter and still encounter today problems and defects. No surprise, litigation, uh, not only policy discussions uh, follow up. There are currently four uh, class, uh, class actions pending in, in, in four member states and only one settlement in Germany where 160,000 uh, German consumers have been receiving compensation up to 6,500 uh, euros each according to the information which has rendered available by, to the public. As you know, this is a settlement, so it's a private uh, matter. Today, uh, we face, therefore, a problem of equal treatment across and among European consumers. Why German consumers should get a better deal or a better treatment than those based in Belgium or Spain or, or Italy. This is a major and serious uh, problem uh, that uh, is leading to mounting pressure on Volkswagen, also follow in the follow-up of a few cases, court decisions that have been uh, giving uh, reason to consumers. So where do we stand today? Uh, what the EU can do, what is ad, ad, has actually done and what it will be doing in the future? Those are the questions that will be addressed without any further ado by Petra de Sutter, member of the European Parliament and chair of the IMCO committee. Thank you for being with us, Petra. Thank you, uh, Alberto, indeed. <clears throat> Good afternoon to all and thank you for inviting me to this webinar. Um, I am indeed chairing the Committee on Internal Market and Consumer Protection, but you will see and also from what I will say that um, some of the issues that I will discuss are not within IMCO's competence, but within the competence of other committees. Of course, this is all the Parliament, um, but I will make that uh, clear. So um, I was asked to, uh, to talk about the aftermath of the Dieselgate scandal, uh, indeed five years ago, as you um, uh, talked about in your, in, uh, in your introduction. Um, I think it's important before I go into the details of what happened in Parliament after that, to frame it in, in the right way, because you could of course say, well, this, uh, this is a development um, and the use of, of cheating software uh, to fake lower pollution output. Uh, but it's also illegal behavior of companies trying to make more profit or it is illegal behavior damaging our environment it's all of the same it's all of that together and it's still quite abstract to most of us i guess but if you express it as the european environmental agency did uh, for the first time in 2015 in numbers of deaths um, then it becomes a, a quite different story and they have put the number of premature deaths caused by uh, NOx, NO2 and other um, exceedances across Europe at 72,000 annually. That means 72,000 people that were not supposed to die yet did die, especially in times of COVID-19. I think we very well know what that means, unfortunately. And this number makes it very tangible for citizens um, to understand what can happen if companies indeed engage in illegal behavior as this um, it also makes it very tangible, I guess, um, why the EU should regulate uh, pollution limits and why they should enforce uh, compliance. Now, 
Dieselgate scandal indeed has sparkled quite some action in the European Parliament and even more so within my own political group. I'm speaking here with both hats as IMCO chair, but I'm also a green politician. So for us, this is really an extremely important uh, file, as you can understand. Now, first of all, um, and, and we should remember uh, that it was not the European enforcement bodies, but actually the American that rang the alarm bell. First of all, we enforced our plea to make the comitology process more transparent. Um, and that's a, a, a specific uh, procedure in, in uh, European lawmaking that escapes, um, you know, public scrutiny and even parliamentary scrutiny. Um, and, and we definitely are asking for many years already to, to, you know, review the whole procedure of comitology. In this case, in particular, uh, Dieselgate case um, on, on car emissions legislation, to say, so to say, car industry experts they were not only given a disproportionate number of seats at the table in comitology, uh, but also EU governments have, of course, defended their national car industries to the detriment of environment, citizens uh, and um, the democratic process of, of the negotiations between uh, institutions, uh, where already the EU governments, of course, are having their say and the industry, their chances to lobby. So you can see that there's a lot of possibilities for uh, lobbying both by member states and the industry directly um, in the comitology, but also in the in the trilogues, in the negotiations. And there is other domains where we know this happens. Um, I'm very active in, in the area of, um, of chemicals and endocrine disrupting chemicals mainly. We can see exactly the same uh, the same mechanisms, the same practices uh, that are pursued in comitology, and this is quite worrying. The second element, which is now actually the, the subject, I guess, of, of this webinar mainly, is the collective redress. And there, I have to say immediately, IMCO is not the main responsible committee. It is Yuri, uh, which is, um, and that's. Um, uh, of course, uh, uh, um, important to say because they have been treating it, but it touches upon consumer protection and internal market uh, very much so. Um, I believe that if, um, you know, uh, industries, big corporations benefit from access to the internal market, um, and that is after Brexit about 450 uh, million consumers, that means that also these consumers uh, should be able to, uh, to have a way of collective redress, cross-border redre redress, um, which, uh, which was not, which was not, and I'm saying in the past, because we, there is ongoing work on that, as I will immediately explain. Um, the consumer should also have access to this market and this big volume um, to, uh, to ask for uh, redress. And um, so now today we indeed understand that uh, Volkswagen settles with German consumers and the other consumers in the EU are left uh, aside. This is absolutely not uh, acceptable. Um, I think we will discuss this in the panel. Now, already in 2018, the Commission came with a proposal for a directive on what was called re representative actions for the collective interest of consumers. Uh, with the aim to give a group of consumers, um, which was then called, which is called a qualified entity, for instance, a consumer organization, the possibility to go to court when their rights have been violated by a trader. And although some member states already had possibilities for this in place, for these so-called uh, class actions, not all member states did. And um, in this proposal, uh, this will change. All member states will have to have a system in place uh, for domestic class actions and member states who have already a good working system can of course keep theirs. But it also concerns this proposal infringements with a cross-border element, which is very relevant to cases like Dieselgate. That means also now that a consumer organization can take representation action in a member state other than that in which it is uh, seated in, in it is designated. Although the Parliament largely supported the Commission's approach, uh, many member states were not very happy with uh, this proposal and uh, rather reluctant to introduce such a European class action system. But nevertheless, um, and this is the negotiations, of course, two weeks ago, there has been a deal on a new directive on collective redress 
between Council, Commission and Parliament. Um, I have been told, because I was not part of that, that the negotiations have been tough because of the differences, of course, between domestic versus cross-border representative actions and criteria for designating the qualified entities that I talked about. Member states will still be free to define the criteria for the entities bringing domestic action, whereas for cross-border actions, there are common and binding criteria set in the directive. And um, it's, uh, I think, logical that many groups, and my group is one of them, would have preferred to see a consistent approach. But we hope that when member states define which entities will be allowed to bring group actions in their countries, they will, in particular, of course, appoint consumer organizations as these are best placed to represent consumers' uh, interests. Now, not uh, unimportantly, now that we see that a lot of questionable practices are going on from a consumer point of view in times of COVID, in the final deal on collective redress, the European Parliament succeeded in gaining its demand to also make air and train passenger rights enforceable in such a collective action before the courts throughout the EU. Um, and you know that, uh, and we have already had debates on air and, and uh, train passenger rights in, uh, in the, the framework of the crisis. Um, there has been calls in the Parliament, and again, mainly also from my group, for few wide class actions for uh, a long time. And the Dieselgate scandal was certainly a trigger uh, for strengthening uh, consumer protection and the possibility for consumers to enforce their rights in courts in class action. So actually, we should um, see the final outcome of the negotiations as a, a major step forwards uh, to consumer protection at EU level. Although uh, we would have asked for more, I guess this is for the time being the best we can, we can have. As you uh, probably know, or maybe not, uh, actually today, the 7th of July, this, um, was, uh, this deal was put to a vote in the uh, Yuri Committee, which is a committee uh, competent for this. So this very morning, and it will be going to plenary soon. Um, I should add that um, when, when we talk about uh, the diesel gate and the difference between uh, uh, the German consumers and other consumers in Europe, uh, as Volkswagen now seems to think, uh, that, that reminds us in IMCO, of course, of another file that we have been working on and that will be on our agenda again in this term. And that is, of course, the, the subject of the dual quality of products uh, within the internal market, because we know, we know certain um, goods or also uh, detergents, for instance, contain sometimes less um, essential ingredients in certain EU member states compared to others, even with exactly the same uh, labeling. And this is very, a very sensitive issue for many of uh, our MEPs in IMCO, mainly because, and it's, uh, I know that the studies have not uh, really confirmed that it's very different from product to product, but there has been a feeling that there is mainly a difference between Western and Eastern European countries. Anyhow, this will be on our agenda again, because it is absolutely unacceptable in a single market um, philosophy, of course. Now, um, I was also asked maybe to, to say a few words, and this is uh, going away a little bit from the Dieselgate scandal, uh, but also to discuss a little bit the current discussions uh, uh, on the on the uh, current uh, crisis and the economic recovery, um, we um, we have seen from the early start of the pandemic that the Commission adopted a new temporary framework for state aids, and that means that of course companies uh, get into cash flow problems, need help, um, and well, what we have seen is that certain member states have been very, very generous in, in state aid, mainly, uh, as you know, Germany, of course. And we, from Parliament side, and again, uh, we, uh, we certainly had, have the, had the feeling that uh, sometimes this is a kind of a blank check to industries, um, which, uh, which should maybe be uh, subject to cer certain conditions. Uh, and these conditions, of course, should fit and should um, uh, be part of the Green Deal ambitions of the Commission. Uh, because we agreed on that, the Commission put it on the top of the agenda, and we're talking about the green uh, transition, of course, um, meaning we have to channel our investments towards green, future-proof projects, sustainable jobs, and so on. And all of a sudden, 
with this crisis now, we see that a lot of governments have spent a lot of money ahead already uh, to save uh, certain of their industries. And avi aviation, of course, is a very good example where we are uh, having strong demands for more sustainable, more green um, investments. Um, but, well, you know, if the state aid is not conditional, that is something that, that is um, questionable. So we, we really ask to, uh, to couple the state aid with green conditionality as it was agreed, because the recovery that we have to uh, work on uh, should be a green recovery. And I always use the same analogy, and I will repeat it here, if your house burns down, you will not rebuild it with the same materials and the same methods of 30 years ago. You will rebuild it with an eye on the future and with sustainable methods and, um, you know, towards the, the, the goals of the Green Deal, of course, with the targets of 2030, 2050 that we all know. So this is for us um, in Parliament. I must say there is a large majority for that. It's not just a green demand. It is really something that a lot of political groups and also member states, by the way, and even industries that are really looking uh, to the future and want legal frameworks in order to secure investments and to know in what direction they have to do that. This is really important to incorporate in the core of, uh, of this uh, economic uh, recovery. I guess this is uh, just uh, some, some uh, ideas uh, that, that I want to throw in uh, the, dis the discussion. But um, if, uh, if you will have your panel discussion mainly on the diesel gate and consumer protection and what happens with Volkswagen, uh, I will be very happy uh, to hear about your thoughts and your ideas. I have unfortunately uh, to leave because we are in plenary this week and I still have a lot of preparations to do for that. But I'm sure that I will be informed uh, by you uh, how uh, you know, we can work together uh, also in Parliament, of course, to, um, to yeah, solve this issue and um, put pressure uh, to, towards uh, yeah, better legislation for all European citizens. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Petro de Sater, for your contribution, your keynote, for sharing so many ideas and helping us contextualize the disengage into the current developments. Uh, very important to remind, uh, I think, each of us how the Dieselgate acted as a catalyst for the uh, adoption of the of a political agreement, which will soon be legislation on collective redress. Unfortunately, it will take some time before this will become a reality for consumers. So we still have to address the Dieselgate major externalities and trying to internalize them through the instruments we have. And we're going to be discussing about this uh, together. Um, let me uh, now uh, perhaps open uh, the floor by briefly introducing you the different uh, speakers. We have Paolo Martinello from Euro Consumers, who has been closely involved in particular on the litigation size uh, in the aftermath of the, uh, of the Dieselgate uh, across uh, European countries. Uh, we have Ursula Pachel from BEUC, who has also been directly involved in particular on the legislative process that uh, has been leading uh, to this political agreement. Uh, and to many other aspects of the of the Dieselgate. We have Marie-Paul Benassi uh, from DG Justice, uh, who uh, has also uh, been a part of the current conversation and who will give us a perspective from the Commission side on the uh, state of play of the Dieselgate. And last but not least, uh, Els Bruggemann uh, from Euroconsumers, who has also been following the unfolding of the Dieselgate over, over the years. So let me start from uh, Paolo to gather some reactions um, from uh, uh, the uh, speech we just heard, the consideration that uh, Petra de Sutter shared with, with, with us. Um, what is the state of play uh, and in particular uh, the robustness of the current litigation approach uh, that uh, Euro consumers, including ultra consumer and others, have been taken vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Dieselgate scandal. What we can expect, Paolo, to happen realistically?
Paolo, did you unmute your mic? We cannot hear you well. I can still not hear you, Paolo. Did you try to unmute? We cannot hear you. Okay. So if we cannot hear Paolo, we move uh, perhaps to uh, to else uh, Brueggemann to get a a sense of what's going on on the diesel gate, and in particular, what is at stake here? What are we talking about? Else. Um, well, you ask me what is at stake, I would say a lot. <laughs> um, when uh, when Dieselgate exploded in 2015, it became clear that they had deceived millions of consumers all, all over the world uh, by tricking them into thinking they would be buying a more cleaner car, a, a greener car, which was not at all the case. So we are talking a lot nowadays about greenwashing. Well, you could say that Dieselgate was actually greenwashing Avon La Letter, a typical example. And, and then they decided to settle in the United States, which is, of course, a very good thing for the US consumers. Uh, but what about all the others? What about European consumers? They have been deceived. They have been harmed in the same way as US consumers. And uh, we think they should be treated with the same amount of respect and also get compensation. And that is exactly why we, as Euro consumers, we started class actions in all four of our countries. So in Belgium, Portugal, Italy and Spain to get this fair treatment of European consumers as well uh, to get the compensation. And then a couple of years later, they decided to settle with German consumers, which again is very good news. And uh, we welcome uh, very much that they acknowledge the harm that they have inflicted upon German consumers. But then the question is, what about all the other European consumers? Because Volkswagen, they have benefited at large of the European Union and the internal market. They also have polluted in the same way all over Europe. Yet, when it comes to respecting basic consumer law, European consumer law, you have on the one hand German consumers and on the other hand all of the rest. Um, Dieselgate isn't a US problem, it isn't a German problem, it's a global one and it's a European one. And all European uh, consumers should be treated with the same amount of respect and they should be treated equally. So when you ask me what is at stake, I would first say um, the strength and the credibility of European consumer protection and enforcement. Volkswagen, they have uh, infringed the same European law all over Europe, yet how do you explain that some consumers get compensated and others don't? How do you explain that some consumers have the tools to enforce their consumer rights and others don't? Um, this is really difficult. It's a very good thing that in the near future we will have uh, some kind of a European class action and, and this is a welcome breakthrough. But this is exactly what we have been trying to do with Euroconsume since the very beginning. Create our own kind with the limited resources that we have. Um, create our own kind of European class action by joining legal forces in all of four of our European countries um, to get uh, Volkswagen to pay. But I would say what is also at stake is, is the European project and the internal market itself. Um, because by paying compensation to German consumers and ignoring to do the same for all the rest of Europe, they are actually jeopardizing one of Europe's core values, which is that all European citizens are equal and they should be treated that way. So by doing this discriminating behavior, they do not only inflict harm upon consumers, but also on the European project itself. I also think that here is at stake the green transition. Um, we are in the midst of crucial moments. Uh, now more than ever, we need to make the shift to a more sustainable economy, a more sustainable society, and we need everyone on board. And yet you have this leading European company dragging around a black history, a black burden, and in this case you could even take it literally, um, refusing to come clean, 
from a major environmental and, and consumer scandal, while they should be focusing on the important challenges ahead, and this is making the green transition, which, in, which includes having cleaner vehicles. Um, and that's why I also think that what is really at stake here as well is the credibility of Volkswagen, the credibility as a leading European mobile company. They used, as I said before, um, they use the internal market to their benefit, yet they intentionally ignore basic European consumer law and they make a distinction between uh, their European clients. So I would like to ask Volk Volkswagen, do you really think that German consumers are that more valuable than all of the other European customers of Volkswagen? And if not, why don't you just compensate all of them in an equal way? Um, moreover, both from a, a company point of view and as a European leader point of view, we need companies as Volkswagen to make the shift towards more sustainable mobility. We need them on board. So I think it's about time that they turn this black page in their history. They come through for their consumers, they pay the compensation and they focus on the important challenge ahead, which is delivering to the green transition. Thank you, Wells. Uh, thanks a lot for highlighting what is a stake and you said it's a lot and actually by mm -hmm. connecting the dots you realize also as petra said by putting figures also on the life lost uh, prematurely uh, you get the dramatic sense of what is at stake here but at the same time there is some surprise in seeing that european consumers are still buying volkswagen cars overall the company hasn't been affected in terms of reputation as much as one could uh, could ex could could have expected and this to me is very surprising Let's try again to go back to Paolo, trying to understand to what extent class actions, uh, those in the cases which are pending today, can realistically uh, hold Volkswagen accountable to the customers who have been cheated. Paolo. Oh. Yeah. We cannot hear you, no. I propose you will do perhaps a test uh, with the team uh, by connecting with them and then getting back to us. It's very frustrating to see you speaking, <laughs> but not to hear your voice. Apologies, uh, sorry. Ursula, um, to you now, uh, to get a sense of uh, uh, not necessarily what is at stake, because I think by now we all know what is at stake, but as we have heard from Petra, there's a lot of expectations that uh, the collective redress instrument will be I, want, I don't want to say make miracles, but it's going to provide a credible answer to the problem that we couldn't really handle with, uh, with, with, with the existing law. Um, what, what, what is your take? How we can get the, the most out of the diesel gate in order to, to craft the best possible instrument, collective redress instrument across Europe uh, by knowing that there are already limits into the current proposal when it comes to the different criteria and this divide between the cross-border and the national uh, level. So to you, Ursula, to give us a bit of a, of a sense of what is going on there and what can realistically we can expect from this new policy tool, legal tool. Yes, thank you very much. Do you hear me all right? Okay, super. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for having me on this panel. It's a, it's a really exciting topic, and we have been working very hard together with my colleagues uh, in the Euro Consumer Group uh, on, on this very topic to hold Volkswagen accountable, uh, which I think to some degree has been started, but certainly not yet finished. And maybe before I answer to your question, Alberto, I would like just to highlight um, that in 2015, when the, the fraud came to light, so to speak, that consumer organizations really worked a lot together to find solutions. And it was like a mirror for, I, I would always and continue to call it a failure of European enforcement. What, what happened there, particularly if you compare it to the US, and ELSE had made, has made that very clear, six months after the, 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 the scandal broke, the US consumers had been compensated or at least the settlement had been achieved, which was quite generous. And now we are like five years after and the only consumers that have been compensated or will be very soon are the German consumers, which is just simply ridiculous. I, I think it really sheds a very uh, clear light on the situation in which we are. And uh, 
uh, at the same time, this has, I think, really released the proposal of having a tool for collective redress. So the, the, the really bad thing that happened, the good consequence is that we have been able to have the political pressure mounting so much that the political uh, decision was taken to have a collective redress proposal on the table. It has been in drawers of different commissions since many, many years and decades, uh, as, as particularly Paolo knows. Uh, and finally, it, it came out. I think if you ask me, and, and, and just look at the situation, what happened. So consumer organizations had to do very different things. The lucky ones could take collective redress because they already had a more or less functioning system. Some of them were trying uh, to have model cases representing one consumer and then maybe taking the step from there. Uh, others have tried to join as a private party to a criminal proceeding. Uh, others have tried to work with so-called legal service providers, like the My Right platform, and that didn't work out. So uh, man, many different solutions have been tried. And now, finally, as Petra said, today the uh, Legal Affairs Committee gave the final blessing to the text that has been negotiated. So we can hope that by the end of the year, at least, we will have it published, and then it will take another two and a half years before it becomes applicable. So that, that's, a, that's quite... Um, good perspective. If we talk about uh, the Euro consumer situation, for example, or the uh, situation of consumer groups in front of a European wide infringement, as it was with the Volkswagen case, I think the really exciting point about the representative action directive, as it will come, is that it gives groups the opportunity to join forces. So it includes a provision that says that um, consumer organizations can take one action against a trader in one country. So they could join together. And this is what would have been the ideal scenario vis-a-vis -vis the Volkswagen case. What I think our message will be now for the member states who have now a very big responsibility in implementing the, the, the directive is that they should always use the Volkswagen scenario as a test case and always ask themselves, how do I need to transfer this into national law so that it really would help consumer organizations to be efficient, uh, so that it really would help consumers to get access to justice, to be compensated. And there are uh, certainly a number of points. First of all, consumer organizations, we hope, will be nominated as eligible by the member states. This again lies in the hand of the member states, but the criteria are clear for cross-border activities. They are binding, and so consumer organizations should be nominated. For the domestic cases, there is a big degree of uncertainty, but I think for this exercise today, I think we focus on the cross-border exercise. So these criteria, I think, uh, the average consumer organizations would be able to qualify, and then it's really up to the member states to nominate them. And then there is, of course, the question of do consumer organizations have capacity? Uh, many do, others don't, and they don't have a traditional enforcement. And here we really account again on the member states because they are obliged to assist consumer organizations, to assist eligible entities. Uh, they should watch out that the court procedural costs are not too high. Uh, and we also hope that the European Commission, and I'm looking forward to hear from Marie Paul, uh, will also launch capacity building programs to support consumer organizations, particularly in the more recent member states. They don't have experience in taking infringement actions, and so they need support. And we, we ourselves will do the maximum to, to help that. Uh, another important element of the proposal is now this um, decision of the member states to go for opt-in or opt-out. We all know that opt-out is much more effective, that in many cases consumers don't bother or they don't know how to do it or they just hesitate. And so if you have an opt-out proceeding, it turns out to be the much more effective tool that you can get. Uh, and there again, it's in the member states' hands to implement it accordingly. And let me maybe say one more, but there are so many points that could be raised, but one thing I would hope, uh, because we talked about the settlement in Germany, which is a fantastic success, of course, for our German member, 
and which is also due to their Mustafestellungsklage, a new law that had been introduced after the Volkswagen uh, fraud. Um, I personally think that this type of settlement would not be possible with the new directive in place. There are provisions about settlement, they don't go into that type of detail, but I think the, the, the claim that Volkswagen had made in Germany was that uh, consumers that are not resident in, uh, in, in, um, in Germany, that their, their uh, claims cannot be included, and the judge accepted that, right? Uh, I think that probably with the spirit of the new directive, this type of deal should not be possible because uh, it, it is indeed uh, an infringement, I would say, as Els also explained very clearly, of the single market principles and of the equal treatment of consumers. Uh, and so the directive should also help in that regard. Uh, I leave it at that point uh, and I'm happy to discuss. Thank you, <laughs> Ursula. Thank you very much. It was extremely, extremely rich. Uh, your argument uh, in, in, in favor of the collective redress instrument is, is, is very strong. And, and you seem to suggest that if we have had such an instrument in the aftermath of the diesel gate, probably we would not be running this webinar today because we would have obtained uh, earlier on uh, compensation. At the same time, you're also suggesting that perhaps the tool, although promising, might not be sufficient because we also need to enhance the capacity of consumer rights organization in order to take full advantage of, of, such, of such a tool. Let's try once more to go back to Paolo to see whether we can get the full story of the, of the class actions uh, currently pending outside of Germany where the matter was settled, uh, but where the class action system, at least the reform one, uh, was uh, and actually played a positive role in, in inducing the company to actually settle. Let's see if Paolo is, is there to get a sense of what we can realistically expect from that. Otherwise, perhaps we can double check with, with Elsie if she wants to give us a bit of a sense of what is going on, at least in the country or countries which is following, who is following, that, that she's following the most. Paolo, are you with us? Hmm. Okay. So Elsie, perhaps before giving, to, giving the floor to Marie-Paul and getting the, Paolo, are you with us? Yes, but without voice. Mm -hmm. So sorry. Else, can you give us a sense of what is going on in those class actions? Where do we stand? What is your prediction there? What we can get out of them besides using them to get perhaps a settlement outside of Germany? You okay. have to unmute. Yeah. Yes, now I'm here. <laughs> I'm making the same mistake. <laughs> no, actually, um, all of our class actions in the four European countries were launched in uh, in 2016, and all of them are based on on the same legal basis. You know, Volkswagen deceived uh, European consumers, and they need to pay compensation. Uh, all of the class actions are currently still pending before court. Um, especially w the one in Spain is advancing quite well, and and we might expect a, a decision there in the near future. But I have to say, in the meanwhile, since 2015, since this Dieselgate scandal exploded, uh, we have, since then, we have uh, had some major important uh, legal decisions proving Volkswagen wrong and actually supporting our case. You know, Volkswagen has always been stating that uh, Europe is totally different than the United States and they did not use a defeat device. Well, actually, the UK High Court decided uh, just a few months ago that no Volkswagen, you did use a defeat device. Um, Volkswagen has always been saying that they don't need to pay, uh, they don't need to compensate European consumers because they, they didn't suffer any harm. Well, here, uh, the highest court in, in Germany, the Bundesgerichtshof, uh, uh, stated, yes, Volkswagen, you did use a defeat device and you need to compensate consumers for this. So you could say that net is closing on, uh, on Volkswagen. And I have to say, I feel that our class actions are stronger than ever. We are more confident than ever. And if needed, we will go all the way with our class actions until all consumers get compensation. But actually, I think now it's more on Volkswagen to decide how and when they want this to end. Um, I think uh, it ha will become inevitable for them to compensate all European consumers. So they need to take a decision. 
do they want to go through this long legal burdensome procedure, um, continuing um, smothering their reputation, disrespecting loyal Volkswagen customers? Do they want to continue wasting precious time and money and energy, which they should better use, uh, for example, uh, on shifting to a more greener uh, uh, economy, which includes cleaner vehicles? Or do they, do they decide to do the most respectful thing? Do they decide to come clean with their uh, consumers, come through for them? pay the compensation and focus uh, on the important challenges ahead, which is contributing to the to the to the green transition. Now, don't get me wrong. Um, I think we need strong, uh, responsible, uh, need strong, powerful European companies, but with power comes responsibility. And uh, I think it's now up to Volkswagen to decide how exactly they want to be remembered. Yes. Moment of truth for for Volkswagen in Europe is approaching because the pressure is is mounting, also and largely because of the court cases you have been uh, bringing uh, forward and which are advancing. So at some point, the reputational damage might actually occur. The one they didn't suffer, if not initially during the first months yeah. in the aftermath of the of the case. Let's turn now to Marie Paul Benassi at DG Justice uh, to get a sense of the role that the European Commission played in the Dieselgate scandal, given its, uh, its own standing position in light of the current regulatory framework and basically what you are preparing uh, in order to follow uh, this, uh, the unfolding of the Dieselgate scandal, which is not over. Thank you. Marie Marie yes, uh, you hear me? Yes. So thank you and uh, good uh, afternoon to all of you. Uh, first of all, I think that Petra uh, mentioned already quite a lot of elements about uh, the, the consequences uh, or what the, um, the Commission did uh, following uh, following the, um, the Dieselgate scandal. Uh, the first thing which, uh, which was done by our colleagues from DG Grow was uh, uh, update and faster, uh, so uh, faster um, update and uh, and more, uh, um, let's say, powerful development of the basic uh, legislation for uh, car uh, approval, which is called the type approval uh, legislation. And uh, because, in fact, the diesel gate has been uh, an infringement of this uh, legislation because they use the system of defeat device in an illegal manner, uh, which they contested uh, because uh, defeat device, I think, has a wrong name uh, because it's primarily um, um, needed in order to manage the exhaust uh, gas uh, system uh, in such a way that it protects the car, the engine, in, in extreme conditions. Uh, and the High Court in Germany has confirmed very recently, as Els uh, mentioned, that in fact uh, uh, the defeat device that they used was not for that purpose of protecting the engine. It was, it was merely to stop uh, the system of, uh, of uh, management of, the, of re recycling of the exhaustion gas uh, on the road. Uh, and so basically there was a big difference between when the t cars were tested and when the car was on the road. So if, if on the road you don't use this system at all, uh, then it's totally illegal. And this was confirmed after years of, of technical discussions. Uh, and this, I think, is a very big step forward for uh, all the ongoing uh, collective redress cases in the various member states. Uh, and I think that this also may be um, uh, the reason why, at a certain moment, uh, Volkswagen decided to settle with the German uh, Consumer Association, because most probab probably they uh, were understanding that the High Court uh, would finally decide that they were guilty uh, and that they, uh, their uh, ac action was uh, clearly illegal and a deception. And this is the other element. So a deception is uh, a, f a fraudulent behavior. It's a voluntary behavior to deceive the consumers. Uh, so on, on this question of this, the deception, 
uh, which is uh, which we could consider it a misleading commercial practice in the in the uh, in the context of consumer consumer law. Uh, this this decision it came very very late, and uh, it was it it was it was not easy to establish because it depended really a lot of technical discussion among all these experts of 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 these de, um, uh, of these uh, defeat devices so this is why there has been very few cases uh, related to consumer protection uh, in the member states of public enforcement but there has been a lot of um, um, activities from our colleagues from DG Grow, like infringement proceedings against certain member states uh, for a bad implementation of the type approval legislation, for the fact that they did not implement penalties, for example, uh, because when you breach uh, this uh, legislation, there are a number of remedies which need to be provided, like what Volkswagen provided, which is uh, a repair of the, of the cars, but also there should be penalties. But this is, let's say, past. Huh? It happened uh, three years ago. And in the meantime, what happened, which is a good, very good news for the consumers, is of course, and uh, several uh, of, the, of the speakers have mentioned it, the adoption of the Representative Action Directive. So what's next for us is clearly finalize uh, the adoption. Uh, and then we will work with uh, the member states on the transposition. But not only on the, with the member states, we are also going to work with all the potential stakeholders uh, for such, uh, for such uh, a procedure, uh, so that uh, it is, um, uh, when it is finally uh, uh, in, um, in operation after two and a half years, it is implemented uh, forcefully and rightly. So it means that the courts need to be well informed uh, uh, about how it works and also the potential uh, qualified entities. And there, Ursula asked me a question about what are we planning uh, in terms of capacity building. So you know that we are still in the uh, MFF negotiations, or so the multi-annual financial framework negotiations, uh, which are not yet uh, finished. Uh, the Commission made updated proposals after the COVID crisis. But uh, the uh, program which concerns uh, consumer protection is a single market program. Uh, it's a bundle of several programs and it includes the consumer protection part. So basically in this consumer protection part, we have more or less the same uh, amount of credits as we had in the previous consumer uh, program. And a part of this uh, money, which is 188 million over seven years, will be dedicated to capacity buildings of uh, national authorities and also um, uh, we will uh, uh, we are planning to assist uh, qualified entities uh, to network for example and we are planning in general to assist national uh, uh, consumer uh, consumer associations to develop their uh, capacities in certain domains and especially legal domains uh, it's also with this uh, by the way it's also with this um, um, programs that you are financing uh, a part of the operations of BERC. Uh, so uh, one last thing I would like to tell you is that we are preparing now for the uh, consumer agenda. So it's uh, the new consumer agenda is a, a, a new strategy for uh, consumer policy over the next uh, five to seven years. And we have just launched a public consultation, um, I think last week, and uh, this uh, new consumer agenda is going to define the main uh, uh, policy priorities for consumer protection and consumer rights and consumer safety in the next years. Uh, this includes, of course, uh, what we uh, intend to do in terms of uh, capacity building and use of the, of the funds, but it also includes um, um, a reflection on the governance of consumer policy in the member states and in particular the role of consumer associations uh, in in this governance because we think that uh, it's very important that consumer associations are uh, have a big role that they are properly funded because they need to act as a counterpower 
uh, in the in the member states they need to do advocacy for consumers and also enforcement activities so it's very important that we have uh, a clear view on uh, on uh, how uh, this is happening in the member states and see whether at the union level we can define some common principles uh, to also support the member states and uh, support a vivid uh, consumer uh, landscape uh, in the in the member state and at the EU EU level. Thank you, thank you very much, Mary Paul. It was very exhaustive. Uh, you clearly show how the Dieselgate has been unveiling some of the inherent limitation of European consumer law and its enforcement, and this acted as a catalyst for the adoption of new policy measures like uh, the new instrument uh, when it comes to. Uh, a, a collective redress uh, model, but also, I would say, a realization that consumer organizations also need to be further supported uh, at different levels to act as a counterpower to the undue influence that corporate actors do play at very different level uh, with, with the political system, but also in, in the market. So uh, it seems very ambitious to rethink the overall governance framework when it comes to the consumer rights space, and I think is is very is very uh, due uh, to, to to do so when transitioning from the from the old system, which has uh, caught up uh, the uh, the dieselgate situation, and the new model, which still has to be fully agree implemented and transposed and and obviously enforce in the future. So there's a lot of work for all of us uh, that will be keeping us uh, busy. As we are coming to, to, to an end, I don't know whether Paolo has been fixing his issue with the mic. Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you, Paolo. We are all yours. If you could condense in three minutes, what's the state of play with your, with your class actions at the moment, uh, building on what else already told us? Yes, Els uh, already did my job, uh, and uh, thank you to, to Els for that. Uh, let me just add uh, two or three points uh, uh, also for, uh, as a comment to what I heard. Uh, Ursula is extremely right when she says that the directive that we are uh, uh, now discussing, and we hope that is near to the end of the long, very, very long uh, uh, street is uh, one of the main impo uh, most important point is the fact that uh, there are some issues of international, private international law that is followed by the directive. I tell you very concretely what is the situation now. Ursula, remember that in uh, the German settlement uh, did not cover consumers that are not resident in Germany. What is happening in Italy is that Volkswagen say that consumers that are in the class action, but they bought the car abroad, are not covered by the class action. So you can see that if we put together these two limitations, one in German and one in Italy, the conclusion is that there is a number of consumers that are not covered, uh, either in German or in Italy, so uh, and will not be protected. So this is a problem, and uh, hope that the directive will solve this problem. Um, second uh, point: uh, okay, in Italy we have a model of class action that we are testing. In the in the case of this gate, uh, we collected the, is an opt-in system, as uh, almost almost everywhere um, in Europe, uh, but not in Belgium and not in Portugal, for example. And uh, we collected about 15% of the consumer involved. 15% is a small number, but it's also a great number. Uh, to collect 15%, that means about uh, uh, 70,000 uh, 70, uh, consumers that entered in our class action is a big job, is a big work. And uh, uh, the capacity to do that uh, is not evident today uh, in the great part of consumer organization. I hope for help in the future, but I also think that consumer organization should try to have shoulders enough large to manage this system. Uh, I, I ask for a public uh, fund, but I also wonder if tomorrow a public, a German public fund will be ready 
to found a class action against Volkswagen, or even more, if an Italian public fund will be ready to uh, support a class action or a representative action against uh, uh, Fiat or against uh, in, in a national champion. So. Uh, to be independent is a good thing, and I think that we will try to do that. Uh, we, it's easy to talk uh, badly about the American model, but the American model and the diesel gate is uh, an example, works. The American model works. And the results in the diesel gate case is extremely clear, extremely clear. I follow the judgment in front of the court of California. It looks like a movie for me uh, coming from Europe. The speed of the decision of the set of the negotiation, the role of the judge, the settlement, the content, it's, it's another word. But the, the fuel of that model are lawyers. We don't like lawyers. I am a lawyer, but I don't love lawyers. In Europe, we decided that the lawyers should not be the fuel for the uh, class action, the group action in Europe. Okay, I agree on that, but we have to find another fuel. If we don't give a fuel to this machine, to this car, it will never, uh, it will never go on. Thank you, Paolo, for your comments. Very, very express and conveyed in a very efficient way. We really got all of them from the inherent limitations of the new model, if they are under encompassing. So there's a lot of work to be done to the idea of creating new uh, funds mechanism and the idea that we need to uh, keep alive a culture of consumer enforcement also within the legal profession, I think is a very important uh, point. Now we are coming to a close, but before this, let's make a round, a final round. If we have to meet again in five years uh, time, uh, which is your prediction? What is gonna happen uh, in five years time? We're gonna be done. We are gonna be settle all the cases, some courts, are going to help you along the way. 30 seconds each, uh, starting from uh, Ursula. Uh, what do you think we're going to be on the Dieselgate scandal in five years' time from now? Yeah, thank you very much. That's a very nice uh, question. My response is that we will have probably, if we're lucky, a culture of European enforcement. European enforcement and the fuel for that will be consumer organizations across the union that will join forces and go against uh, companies that do European infringement. So I think that that is the future, I hope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Marie-Paul, what do you expect to happen in the next five years? Well, in, in five years, I hope that all this uh, will be settled because um, company will understand that they are going to uh, head better uh, economically. I think at the end of the day, they make their account, it's better that they, they pay compensation. But I think that in five years time, when we have all these new instruments, uh, I think that these instruments will be very deterrent. And so businesses will really have to think very seriously if they want to continue to cheat consumers. Right. The important role of deterrence when you have an effective system. Uh, else. In five years, yeah, then will we almost be 10 years after the Dieselgate scandal exploded. So I truly hope that at that time we have compensation for consumers, either through a settlement, either through court cases that are still pending. But like I said, the net is closing in uh, on Volkswagen. And what I really would like to see within five years is like Ursula and also Maripol already uh, 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 expressed as well, that we would have a total different culture in terms of uh, consumer enforcement. Um, I can speak for my organization that we really look forward to team up with other consumer organizations in other countries to tackle these cross-border infringements. Thank you. Well, Paolo, final 15 seconds, your prediction. Yes, I, I think I propose to meet the, uh, together in five months, not in five years. I am rather optimist as far as the diesel gate is concerned that in a few months the affair will be uh, settled all over Europe. Why I say that? It's uh, the, until a few months ago the uh, Volkswagen position was very clear, very unacceptable, but very clear. We don't want to give one money back to consumer in Europe. Now this position is broken because in German, the situation is completely different. I think that 
Volkswagen cannot defend this situation. He has put a, a step in the water. He has to cross the river. He cannot stay in the middle of the river. So I am quite optimistic. And I think that there is also a political issue in this affair. Trust, consumer trust, consumer confidence is based also on compensation of damages. Not only, but also on that. You are right when you said before that Volkswagen is still selling cars. This is the good news for us. We will never settle a big affair with a, a producer that is going into bankruptcy. Volkswagen is not going into bankruptcy. It's a great producer and we exist and we want the great, the great and a prestigious producer uh, solve this problem very quickly, not five years, five months. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, Paolo, for sharing your optimism and expecting uh, an acceleration uh, in the coming in the coming months because of the many reasons we mentioned. Our webinar is coming to an end. I thank you all of you, all of the panelists, including our keynote speaker, Petro de Sattler, for sharing so many ideas and talks. Uh, the next uh, webinar uh, is planned for September. Actually, we have three uh, uh, webinars in September, uh, one on the European Green Deal circular economy, another on smart tech, another on the smart economy and investment, and then a calendar that is going to bring us all the way to Christmas. So without any further ado, let me wish you a good summer. I hope you enjoy the four seminars, the four webinars we had over the last few weeks and months uh, in the midst of the pandemic situation, but which allow us to continue working, exchanging and meeting all the different stakeholders. I remind you that the purpose of this webinar series is to inform uh, a constructive conversation on how different stakeholders can work together towards better consumer protection. Thank you very much. And again, I wish you a good summer to all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.